today I'm talking about something that could save you potentially millions of dollars for your retirement. That is getting the asset allocation right inside your Australian superannuation fund. That is the mix of how much is invested in shares, in bonds, in property and cash, and what is effectively going to derive the return for your future retirement. Hi there, I'm Jared Brown, Australian expat finance planner here in Singapore, working with Australians here and across the globe to make the most of their money. Today, we're talking about an incredibly important topic and that is asset allocation or the level of risk you are taking on with your Australian superannuation fund. Time and time again, we see two common mistakes. Number one is people have their superannuation split between two different risk profiles on a completely arbitrary basis with the best of intentions. Usually there's a bit in the balanced one and a bit in the high growth one. And the idea behind it was, well, I want to diversify my risk. Well, what you really should have done is just gone in the middle and put it into the growth one. That would have done the mix for you. And quite often there is so much overlap between the investment options that that diversification is not really being achieved anyway by having the mix of the two. But the more devastating mistake that we often see people making is the way that they choose their superannuation fund. And that is far too often looking for the cheapest investment option available. Now, I don't know if this is because we've been flooded with advertising over the years from the industry super funds. You might remember them, the two people going up the escalator or whatever it might be, and the, the cheaper fund going up faster or higher or more aggressively than the other, and therefore, we need to look for the lowest cost fund, or we're simply uh, long-term believers in the quote that, well, a dollar saved is a dollar earned. And sometimes that can be very true. But imagine if we apply that same logic to everything we do. We look for the cheapest lawyer, the cheapest accountant, the cheapest car, the cheapest investment property. We can probably quickly realize that we may not be getting the best outcome. And as the saying goes, you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. So let's have a look at some real life examples when it comes to superannuation and why the cheapest may not always be the best. So if you look at a well-known fund in Australia, we won't name it in this video, but we'll utilize their real return data. Now their cheapest investment option has an annual running cost of 0.04% per year. Now their Balanced version, so not the cheapest one, but the same risk profile as the first, runs at an annual cost of 0.98%. Now, if we then look at their growth version, so a higher risk profile, aiming for a higher return over time, that runs at a cost of 0.87%. So we have 0.87 at the higher growth end, and then we have two balanced versions, one at 0.98 and one at 0.04. So our logic of finding the cheapest, the lowest cost, and that always being better, would suggest we should go for the cheapest fund. But let's have a look at what the actual returns have been over the last 10 years, and why cheapest may not always be best. So if you look at the annual returns, now this is as at Q2 2024, looking at the last 10 years worth of return data. On the growth side, so the highest growth of those three investment options I mentioned, that delivered an annual return of 9.19% per year. Now these returns are net of fees, meaning after fees have been deducted. Now we would often expect that that would deliver the best return given the higher amount in growth assets. <clears throat> the balanced version, that was the more expensive one, delivered a return of 8.37% per year. And our cheapest fund, our cheapest balanced option, which we all thought would do better, right? Because it was much cheaper and a dollar saved is a dollar earned, delivered a return of 7.49%. So we had 7.49 on the cheap end, 8.37 on the more expensive end, both running the same risk profile and 9.19 on the more aggressively invested version that is often far more suitable for those with more time before they can access their super and retire and therefore need to dip into those savings. Now let's have a look at a real life example of what this would have meant in dollar terms 
choosing each of these options. So let's assume that I'm 30 years old, I've got $50,000 sitting in my super fund today, and I'm earning $120,000 a year. Now I'm not contributing anything extra into my super fund, I've got a mortgage to pay, I've got a life to live, but I've got my employer contributions going in, and they've been rising from 11 to 11.5% this financial year, to 12% potentially next, and potentially increasing from there. But we've just modeled this on the current contribution rate. So we've got our contributions going in. Now in 10 years time, under the high growth version, so the higher growth of the three options, I've got $322,800 sitting inside my super. Now of the more expensive uh, balanced versions, I've got 306,317. And the cheapest version, which we all know already performed worse, I've got 289,000. So for all that money I saved in fees, I actually lost $17,000 over that 10 year period. Now what if we extrapolate that and extend that time period out to 65? Let's have a look at what the numbers look like then. So at 65, under the cheapest version, I've got $2.66 million. Not an awful outcome, but could have been better. If we look at the other balanced version, the more expensive one with a higher fee, I have $3.3 million, so some $650,000 better off. And under the high growth version, I have $4.06 million. That is $1.4 million better off than I would have been under the cheapest version that is on offer. Now, if we apply the 4% rule, that is about an extra $56,000 that I have to spend every year when I'm retired. So when it comes to your superannuation, don't ignore the risk of the appropriate asset allocation. Base it on your age, on your goals, how long have you got before you can realistically tap into your super. And of course, recognize cheapest is not always best. That does not mean you should go for the most expensive fund. It means it is always a balance, always a trade-off. And of course, up to you. Seek advice, consider exactly what is right for you. Drop me a note with any questions. Thank you very much for tuning in. Do remember to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and see you in the next one.